Okay, so thank you all for coming back. I hope you had a nice lunch. I thought it was quite nice outside after the foggy morning. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I'm quite excited um, to go through with you uh, some hands-on data for PRM. And I think as we do that, um, you will review a lot of the features you've learned throughout the week. We'll talk about retention time scheduling, exporting transition lists or like precursor lists, um, importing data and, you know, looking at uh, some, we'll do like a short group comparison again also at the end. And that just underlines that what you learn on some other data set will fit uh, exactly for the new data sets. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, so this involves a couple of steps, you know, where one just has to set up the document a little bit. Um, and we'll set it up PRM specific now. So, um, you know, we will be working with this particular folder here called PRM, QE and Triple TOF. Um, I have two different data sets in there, an Orbitrap. Um, and then also I have a you know, kind of a PRM uh, triple TOF data set in here. But we may not be able to get to that, um, but I just wanted to put it in that if you are at home one day, um, you know, you could have a look uh, how something like that looks. When you do have these sky zip files, um, those are, that's an entire skyline shared document. When one unzips these things, they come out as like the sky file, the sky D, the sky view, the libraries, everything is in this zip file. So if you are interested, you could just open um, this zip file and just see how, how that data file looks. In fact, here I have, and maybe we even get to that at the end, here I have one file that is just DDA, and then here is one file that's DDA and then MRM um, HR, that's how Syx used to call those uh, PRM data files imported. Anyway, but we will start uh, with the thermo data. <coughs> so there's a folder, it's called webinar. But um, we'll get to all the content. What I would like you to do now is actually let's open the Skyline document again. So if you just go to your... Um, Skyline daily or Skyline main release uh, software. <coughs> so that's here, Skyline. And then um, we, let's just open uh, a blank document here. And so now, um, I mean, it is interesting, sometimes when you have a different scan type, whether that is uh, MS1 filtering or PRM, it initially takes a little bit setting up the settings. Once you do it one time, I actually save kind of templates of, you know, what I, what my kind of typical workflow is. And then next time I do an acetyl MS1 experiment, I can just start with something that I had done before. Um, so, but as we are doing this the first time, um, we'll, we'll just walk through the individual steps. But then we'll have it for later. <coughs> Okay, so, um, you know, we will have to set up peptide. And in fact, um, you know, there is some documentation in the um, PRM webinar folder. Um, there is a document uh, file, a Word file, a PDF. And this was also available as webinar, like a video in the webinar series that um, Brandon has, webinar number 17. So you can review it later there also. Okay. So um, we'll open the blank document and um, I mean, let's just save this maybe in a folder, save as, and let's try and go to that folder that's called PRM, um, PRM QE and triple TOF, maybe PRM webinar. Let's just put it in there in that layer and we can call it just PRM. Okay, save that. Okay. And then uh, we'll have to set up all the different settings we've been working on uh, during the last few days. So let's start with um, the kind of most generic setting here, peptide settings. So um, there is, a, you know, enzyme and digestion. That's always something that's uh, highly relevant, right, for any of the experiments. So here um, we will also use trypsin, but in fact, um, I mean, I had selected, it remembers, see how it remembers settings from what last time was done on this computer. And I had set four missed cleavages. Let's just set, say one, which is more appropriate to a proteomics type experiment here. 
So this data set, um, these were like different uh, mouse types and they now are looking at the mouse proteome and um, so for example in this case um, they were trying to put in a background proteome. Um, the background proteome is nice because it can link proteins in the background proteome to just peptides in the target tree and then you know what, what uh, protein did the peptide come from. So let's in this case actually build a background proteome. So, um, you know, um, you can, if you have a background proteome that you have already made, I mean the other day you made one for yeast, uh, you can add something else, another uh, proteome if you have already made it, but we will have to make something new. Um, so basically what we do is just go to add and then we can give it a name. So let's just call it mouse. Um, and then, so now um, we will have to create it because we don't have it yet. And so let's click on create. And um, what we will have to do is, um, let's see, let me see, did I do this right? Sorry, let me just cancel out here. Mm -hmm. Mouse. Oh, create, this is just to give it the name. Right, we are creating it, sorry. Uh, so we'll just have to, I thought, yeah, let's just give it a name, mouse, mm -hmm. and save it as that. And now, um, you know, it sets uh, the, you know, it gives us the path where we wanted to save it. And now we can add a FASTA file. So um, I will go to this folder here and, um, you know, there's a FASTA file. Um, it's in the Skyline webinar folder. This is the file and, um, Where is it? Oh, it's in the, so in fact, I haven't said to you, I hope you all, um, did you all extract uh, the webinar folder initially? Um, yeah, so I, I didn't say that because I had already done it. Um, but w after you have extracted the webinar uh, zip folder, and if you hadn't yet, uh, you can still do it now. Uh, there will be a folder that's also called webinar 17 and um, in that folder, if we go to that, there's a FASTA file, that's the mouse FASTA file and uh, we can click on it and then just say open. And now it has to add in all these proteins, so it just takes a little while to do that. <coughs> um, but here, uh, when we build the um, kind of the proteome and the proteome background, this will actually get back to the question we had earlier in the day about uh, selecting unique peptides. Because there are options that we will walk through in, in a second where you can click uh, whether you want things that are just unique or not. Okay, so it just has to go a little bit through, through the steps. The mouse proteome is a little bit bigger, but it uh, kind of pays off in the long term to do this. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I, maybe I can already tell you when we, in the next step, we'll be able to use, they call it, enforced peptide uniqueness. And we will see it uh, in the next few steps. At the same time, this has actually finished. Um, it says the edit file included six repeated protein sequences and they um, you know, just uh, just an informative uh, note to us. We say okay, and actually we're done with this. The proteome contains 16,800 proteins, so that's quite nice. And let's say okay. And now here, this is what I mentioned to you. Um, here it says enforce peptide uniqueness. You can either enforce that for the protein level, right, that you don't have protein isoforms, or you could enforce it for the gene level that's maybe, um, you know, kind of uh, splice variants or you could, uh, you don't want something that's cross species. So, you know, but in our case, um, we want to select proteins. So if you all please select proteins for enforced peptide uh, uniqueness. And then we can just say, okay. Okay. And yeah, so now um, that's the, oh, I could have left this open settings, peptide settings in the prediction. Um, we went a lot about this the last few days. Uh, here are the retention time predictors. Uh, at this point of the game, one could add something in here. 
Um, but we don't actually uh, do this here at this moment for this data set, but the options are there. And then there's also here some options for iron mobility predictor. Um, so if somebody does iron mobility, that will become important. But again, we're not doing this for this particular data set. And, um, you know, so then, um, yeah, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay. Actually, so there is one field here, because we're not using the predictor of retention time here. What uh, we do s use, though, is we use the measured retention time when present. And this is maybe, for example, somebody had done a DDA run, they put the DDA run into the um, Skyline file, and then you can use that to direct your uh, file import and use this time window there where to import the file or extract the chromatograms. So the time window, let's just set this to five minutes here. And then we're actually ready on this sheet. So we can actually, if I say OK, it will leave the peptide settings. I can just go to the next filter, so then I don't have to reopen it. So let's just uh, do that. Let's go to the filter tab now. So the filter tab, um, you know, I mean, in this particular case, um, they just wanted to, um, you know, have like a minimum length and maximum length. So in this case, the researcher was interested from seven to 26, but all of these settings, they're relatively forgiving, I guess. Um, you know, this, um, we don't really need anything here. You can exclude certain things. So maybe just make sure we're not in excluding anything at this moment. You could exclude methionine residues or could exclude things that are motifs for glycoproteins. So, but in our case, let's not uh, do anything here. But what we want is auto-select all matching peptides. So that we want to have checked. So that, um, you know, the, the proteins, they can, um, you know, they're selected from the background library and the spectral library. Okay, so we check that and then we're done with this. So next we will go to the library um, tab. And as you see, even though this document I started from scratch, uh, because the other day we worked a little bit with some other yeast libraries, uh, while it doesn't have those checked, it suggests those to you. So in fact, that is actually quite nice because sometimes uh, even with a new project, maybe you still want to keep your old library in there. So it kind of keeps these things just at grip for you. So you can use them if you want to, but you don't have to. So if we don't check them, it doesn't matter. But uh, let's build some library here. And um, in this case, let's just click on build. And then usually you just give it a name. And so the researcher here, they had some heavy peptides that they bought. And then they just ran the heavy peptides by DDA and built a library that way. So they wanted to see how they fragment and if they see all the peptides. And, um, so, and then basically we want to use those heavy peptides in order for us, those are the ones we're interested in. We'll import them into the tree. And in Skyline, you can have it so it imports like heavy and light together. Um, so, I mean, this library that was built is also what we want to have in the Skyline tree, right? So, um, so it's actually, that's where a lot of people often start. If they have synthetic peptides, um, they use that. But you could also just use a library from your other DDA run and then not knowing what you necessarily want to do yet and figure that out on the way. Let's call the name heavy. And um, yeah, <clears throat> and now we have to um, kind of specify the output path. And so let's go to browse. And let's be, yeah, so in my case, it pointed me to the webinar 17 because we saved the Skyline file there initially. So that's the right place. So let's say save there. And now it has a cutoff score. Um, this particular group. Um, they used a cutoff score of 0 0.9, which was an FDR of 0 0.01. So let's do that. And then um, in this case, we don't have IRT uh, peptides, so we don't need to say that. And um, yeah, and then all we need to do now is click next. Yes. Uh, I think so in this case. Oh, actually, we don't in this case, I think. 
Um, yeah, let's see. Um, you know, I'm so used. Um, yeah, actually, they don't want to do it here, so we can uncheck it. I'm so used to keeping the redundant library because in the DDA, I just kind of like having it. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, in this tutorial, they, they uh, didn't want to. Do you know what a redundant library is? OK. Anybody know? So when you make a library, in the very past, it was like you have a, you have a uh, say you have like 20 DDA runs and you build a library, most likely you have one peptide, the same peptide, um, also seen in the other replicate, right? So maybe you saw it in five replicates. The master library really only needs one instance, right? So the master library will only put one of those identical MSMS in, or identically identified MSMS. Uh, and that's what the master library is. The redundant library contains all other four MSMS spectra also. And for PRM, it's not that important. For MS1 filtering, sometimes it's nice because then in the MS1 traces, they show up as real MS1 I mean ID lines in the, in the replicate if the redundant library is there. But for SRM and PRM, I think the redundant library is really not that important. Uh, so let's uncheck redundant library here. And then you can go to next. And as you saw, if you ever click next to quick, you can always go back with the previous. So then here, the input files. Um, so what are input files when you build a library? What uh, type of file would one have to import into that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. XML, DDA result, any kind of search engine result, right? So um, that's what we do here. And so you say add files. And in fact, uh, we'll just have to go to the correct folder now. So go to document and then go to PRM QE, PRM webinar, then your webinar folder. And um, so we, we are making the library from the heavy uh, peptides. So they have a heavy library folder go there, and then you see there's two PEP XML files. So let's highlight both of them. And this is the database search result now. And uh, let's say open, and see now it uh, put the files there, it already checked them. And that's it. And so now we say finish. And see here how in the lower left, it's reading the spectra from the heavy file in. And then after that, it will read the spectra from the other file in. And while it's doing that, um, so now it's building the library. See, it has like the progress report. This should go quite quickly. You see it already checked the heavy library. It now says, uh, oh, I'm done. The library is built. So that's all great. So um, and in fact, then in this case, the researchers, in fact, they, um, they said, well, we had some other uh, library that we had uh, obtained from DDA acquisitions of like the mouse samples. They wanted to have that in also. So let's add a second library in. And so the way how to do that is you can just say edit list and then say add. And now we just have to give it a, a name so we can call it DDA run or something. Um, and now we have to browse where we want uh, that library to go. Oh, actually, this particular case, I think um, we didn't want to build it. See, that was the difference, right? Initially, when from the heavy library, we were building it. So it reads in the original search results, and then we build it. In this case, we wanted to add a library. So this was from the shotgun data set. And that just takes a long time to build, so we don't want to wait too long here. So somebody else has already built the library, and then you can just add it. And that's actually also the beauty when you have uh, maybe at some point made, uh, have some collaborator, and they say, I have this, um, do you want to have my library? That was really helpful for me. And then they can send you their library, the blib file, and then you can just import it. And so all this is very easy to disseminate um, kind of, um, you know, uh, knowledge. Of course, they can also just send you their um, kind of file, the Skyline file, where it will be. But this is just a way of very easily adding uh, data. 
So um, let's just uh, specify the parts where this particular library would be. So it's in the same webinar folder and it's in the shotgun library folder. And there's one file, the blip file. Um, and so you click on that and open. And so this is pre-built. Uh, so as you see, there's no processing. It just goes right in. And you can just say, OK. It's actually something interesting when you have more than one library uh, in, in Skyline. Uh, it, it matters what the order is. So if we say OK here, OK, so we have the DDA run here and then heavy. So we want to be sure that the DDA library is on top because then um, when there's spectra, um, you know, it takes the spectra first from uh, what is on the top. So let me just uh, have a quick look here. Um, so yeah, they, they wanted to have that the uh, DDA library is on top and then the secondary library is the heavy library. So yeah, each person can see um, which library they think has better data. <coughs> so uh, the next thing we need to set up is in modifications. See, this is actually where previously we had actually uh, done the acetyl K. And this is what uh, my data set used. So in this case, it makes no sense whatsoever. So let's uncheck the acetyl K. But we talked earlier about PTM, right? So here, you could build your own PTMs and then uh, click on check for them and edit and add them from the list. But so what is important here is now um, we will have heavy standards. So that's, uh, let's just make sure that we add the right labels that we will use in, uh, as isotope modifications. So as I was saying, it depends a little bit what people have done uh, previously on their computer. That's what will show up here. <clears throat> in this case, um, so do you all have like the K8 and the R10? No? OK. Um, do you have anything in your? No? No? OK. Um, let's add it in then. So actually, this good. Um, so you know what? Um, let's let me take this one out on my case, so you uh, see how I add it in. So let's say you want to you get some isotope labeled peptides, and you know it doesn't always have to be K or R. I had something the other day had like a valine was uh, isotopically labeled. So you can totally tailor here what you uh, what that should be. So. Are you all on this edit isotope modification window? OK. So let's do add. And then let's give it a name. Um, let's call it um, something um, simple for now. Lyse 8. Right? So the lysine can come 13 carbon six times, and then 2 and 15. So it's like 8 label. The lysine can also come as uh, lysine carbon six, six. Um, but here we have basically everything labeled. Um, so all the 13 carbons are labeled. Oops. So what we need to do, of course, first we um, need to define the K. K. And then let's just say, well, all the 13 carbons should be labeled and see it recognized. Oh, there's six uh, carbons. And then all the 15N, and then it says, um, <coughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so then it added two, right? So now it's like the, the mass shift in the stable isotope is eight. And uh, yeah, so then I would say, oh, and then also you want to have this be on the C terminus. So normally in triptych peptides, right, that's where the K or the R would be. So we can define that here. And if I say OK now, it's actually interesting because um, they say, yes, you could use what you want to name it, or you could use the Unimod name what Unimod is using. And I sometimes actually prefer the Unimod because then if I have different document, it's always the same. So I, let's just click on the Unimod here. And then now it also has a more specific name, right? 13 C6 and 15 2 C terminal K. Sorry, so yes? Yeah, uh, yeah. That is true. 
but I mean, in this case, um, because it's PRM, you know, I mean, you really, yeah, you will monitor the, the proper length peptides. But yeah, one has to look what one, yeah, the settings uh, determine some of those things. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> Often people don't necessarily like uh, peptides that have missed cleavages for PRM or SRM because there's a little bit more variability in there. So um, that's why people then sometimes would exclude that altogether. Right. But let's add like, a, like an arginine label in also. I mean, let's add it originally again. Um, arginine, does anybody know in what flavors arginine comes for stable isotope label? Mm -hmm. But then what's the mass shift from the light to the heavy? 10. They have 10 and they also have number 6, right? 6 when it's just the carbons. But in this case, it was 10, so um, arginine 10. So they have all, so what we just do is we lick, um, thing, get the arginine and then same thing, C terminus, and then 13 and 16, 10. And um, then we say, okay, they already have that. Um, Yeah, it doesn't really matter. In my case, in your case, uh, you you probably don't have it yet. Um, so just say okay, and um, you know, in my case, um, there's a little bit redundancy now, but it doesn't matter. It's funny that it doesn't suggest the um, kind of Unimod name. That's all right, though. So did you get both of the labels in, arginine and lysine? OK, great. That's perfect. This is important. And again, this is something that Skyline will remember. You'll ha never have to do this again as long as you're on the same computer. So that's actually one, one beauty thing about this. And then what we'll, let's say OK here. And then we'll have to be sure we have, um, we actually have to check the thing. Um, so yeah. So check uh, the two labels that you just uh, made here for the lysine and for the arginine. And uh, the only other thing that we have to pay attention to is that it says heavy here at the bottom. Do you have that all? OK, great. So everything, that was really important. Um, for the quantification tab, um, we don't really have to go through too much. These are things one can set up here. Um, but one important thing is here, because we have heavy peptides, for the normalization method, uh, let's check ratio to heavy. Because we have uh, the heavy peptides, so we might as well take advantage of those. And then, uh, you know, some of these other things we don't have to uh, pay attention to. But then here, um, MS level, um, we want MS2. I mean, even if we were to import MS1, um, you know, signal, usually we want to quantify on the fragment ions. And then the units, I guess it depends what the experiment is. Here it's femtomol. So we can just say femtomol. And, um, yep. So the things here at the bottom, they don't apply to us, so we can just leave them as R. So I would say, uh, let's just say OK here at the moment. Mm -hmm. Let me see. First of all, um, yeah, so let's also go to prediction. If you have already clicked OK, just go back and open the peptide settings. In the prediction, um, I think I thought we had that already. Um, but. Yeah, I think this all doesn't apply to us here. So, I mean, we, yeah, this, this is all good for us here. So we can say, OK. So the next really important thing is let's go to settings and transition settings. And let's go to prediction. So what you want to look at, this, these are just some really standard settings here. Let's just make sure we are monoisotopic here in both of the top things and everything else doesn't apply to us. OK. And then in the filter, now this is an important thing. So uh, because so what the settings that we have here now, they're all for precursor ions. But what we really want is like also now we want to add B and Y ions here. So in fact, we could even take out the precursor ions. So let's just add B and Y ions here. 
And then for the ion charges, um, we can say one and two, and those are the charges for the, for the ion types, for the fragment ions. And the precursor charge, I guess, doesn't apply here because um, we don't import MS1 here at this given experiment. But uh, let's just say two and three here. And um, yeah, everything else is pretty uh, similar here from, we usually, let's go from ion, they say ion one, I mean, people have their preferences. Um, I mean, we can say what they say, but um, they'll have a mass cutoff in the next filter also. Uh, human, usually I don't ever like to use like really low ions, but let's go just from ion one to last ion. Um, and then I'll show you a little bit what, how to counteract that it doesn't pick something at 100 m over z later. For the precursor exclusion window, so it would just mean that it doesn't want, shouldn't take a um, fragment ion that's really close to the precursor ion because there could be like some non-fragmented precursor ion in the MSMS -MS, uh, spectrum still. So let's say that to, uh, to be 5 m over z. So, and then we'll have to make sure auto-select all matching transitions is checked. And we can go to the next, the library thing here. Let's change the ion match tolerance to 0 0.05. And I actually also like uh, having 10 ions and PRM, why not go for many ions? You are allowed to do it. You can always change this later again. And then let's have from filtered ion charge here, okay? Then for instrument, so here we uh, give a mass range. And so here they actually say, because they started earlier from ion one, but that's kind of silly, right? Nobody wants to start on ion one. But then they set like a filter here, a mass filter and say only start at 340 as minimum. And your top, let's go to 1200. And this is for w the mass range that the fragment ions should be in. And um, this is fine with the match tolerance. So this site is all ready, and now the most important one, full scan. And uh, yeah, so see here, this is what we had played around with earlier when we looked at MS1 filtering. Remember how I showed you with the FTICR? Um, so if one wants to, one can add MS1 scan, if one does even make it into a PRM experiment. But in this case, they didn't acquire MS1. Um, although I always do, I always sacrifice a little time but here you can just check the MS1 filtering off by go to isotope peak included and just say none. And then here, now we get to MSMS filtering. And if we click on the little arrow here, so it's either none and targeted or DIA. So for PRM, what do you think we should take? Hmm? Targeted, yes. Uh, DIA, people really understand like the comprehensive uh, SWAT type. Uh, that's what is meant with DIA and targeted, that's really PRM. And uh, because it is a targeted assay, but it's different from SIM. So it's a full scan MSMS filtering. Um, do you see that difference, right? In SRM, you only scan one thing, that's all you have. That you don't have to filter or anything, you just take the entire file and put it in. But here, you have so many other things in your MSMS, you're only filtering out those fragment ions that will be in the tree. Um, so we call this like a full scan and you do a filtering step. Anyway, so here we could have like a retention time prediction or something. In this case, let's check include all matching scans. Okay, all right, and then say okay. And let me see, maybe not quite yet, I guess, let me see. I think we say okay, great. So now we have to populate our tree. We could do it from the library, but in this case uh, we want to get um, a transition list that was predefined already because they had prior knowledge about it. And uh, so you can, what you can actually do is you can just, uh, you know, do, for example, if you go to uh, file, insert, actually you go to edit, edit, insert, and you can insert peptide lists or protein lists. Um, but you know, so that those options are there. Maybe you have a list of peptides you want to look at. But uh, we can actually go um, and uh, import a list. Uh, but they were nice, and they saved another file for us. Um, you know, let me see. Um, so you can copy these in. 
so let's maybe do that here. Um, so maybe we should just save it uh, first in, at this moment here. Let's save this so we don't lose all the work we put in now, right? So I actually always save in between and sometimes I save a version two so I don't lose my other things if I do something wrong. That's sometimes a nice thing, particularly when you are at, like now, you're at a place where all your template is all set up, right? So we save it and let's make the window a little bit smaller so we can go back to our folder. And in fact, there should be a file in there. And, um, you know, so um, there is an Excel file in the webinar folder. And see, there is a, a file that's called target peptides. Clearly, those are the target peptides that they generated heavy peptides for. So there's a column C. Um, take the column and just highlight all the peptides in here. Uh, but not the header on the top. And then just do control C, co control copy, and go back to your skyline file. Mm -hmm. And now what we can do is, um, so make that big again, we can go to edit, insert, and peptides. And then you can go anywhere, you know, there it highlights the upper left. And now you can just control V and it automatically uh, populates uh, this list. And it's interesting, even though we only copied in the peptide list, it, it knew what the proteins are. And that's because we have the background proteome. So that was kind of nice to put in. So now the peptides, you know what proteins they came from. So this is actually quite helpful. So um, let's just say insert here. All right. So this is pretty cool. Let's uh, go a little bit to the right. So if you, uh, so why is it that at the very end, why are these Ks, why are they bold and blue? So let's go to the first peptide and click on one of the plus signs and see how now it has actually these pairs, right? It has the light and the heavy in there. So uh, that's when, you know, it indicates uh, now with, it makes it dark blue uh, because it's the pair of isotope and light. So, you know, so that's what they mean with that. So, yeah, so now we have uh, built our document here. And, um, yeah, let's, yeah, so we have inserted these things. And let's just save this now, file, save as, and let's save it as um, PRM2. Save. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see if you go, for example, on we expanded the first peptide here, click on the heavy uh, 643, the first peptide, and see how nice you can see the spectral library now. So this is quite nice. All this data is now inserted. We have the library in. We have our tree populated. We have all the light and heavy partners there. So we're really ready now uh, to do some experiments. So if you want to do PRM, um, one step is, of course, now you need to uh, kind of um, measure like a first measurement in PRM, right? So uh, you can use Skyline to make the method for the instrument and you can here export like a list uh, that then you would uh, import into your instrument later. So what we can do here is uh, make a list using a report. Um, but you know, in the interest of time, we may not even have to do that here right now. But what you, and you've done this before. So with the report, you could just export all the precursor ions that you have in the Skyline document. And then all those precursor ions you could uh, read in into your mass spectrometer. And we'll go over that a little bit in the next session. Uh, and then you can acquire um, those peptides in PRM mode. So um, I think I don't have to export the report. So you would just get a, a transition list, like a list of these precursor ions here that then the instrument would do PRM on. So, you know, this way you can use Skyline to help you to know what are even your precursor ion masses because you only initially maybe have the sequence of the peptides that you want to monitor. <clears throat> so. Imagine you have now your in instrument and, um, you know, you want to, um, oops, you see. 
you want to know after you have acquired all the data, import the data back into Skyline. So let's assume we're at that step. Um, let's go first and do edit and say expand all and expand maybe precursors. So you can actually see now uh, that by the definitions we gave in the filter, you have uh, in all cases you have the light version and you have the heavy version and then you have all the fragment ions here. And then for the next pipe type, you have the light and the heavy and maybe light and heavy again with different um, kind of charge state and so on. So now imagine you have run uh, some of your first PRM experiment and now let's uh, import the import the data back in. So what, that's really easy and it's the same way how have we have done this before in all cases. So let's go import results and then OK. And uh, let's the webinar folder, let's go in there, webinar 17. And so PRM data. And then there's a folder standards because this is just the heavy standards that we kind of ran now. And um, let me see. Yeah, um, so standards and then have the uh, MZ XML, right? So this is um, transformed into a neutral format. Uh, so MZ XML, everything can read in. So this is what we're opening and now our data will import. And you know, these are this, the displays that we always see. Meanwhile, let's take the peak area view and uh, kind of dock it here a little bit. And then um, the retention time, let's dock that at the bottom while this is importing. And so it's already done. See how quick this was, right? So, uh, oh, it's not quite done yet, but mm -hmm. So, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. We can just kind of put this here at the bottom. And so you see um, that some cases see the lights, right? The lights, they all don't have any signal. If you click on the second peptide here, right, the light, there's nothing there. But this was a heavy standard mixture, right? So there's nothing in the light, but you see like a really nice signal in the heavy here. And um, So what you would now do is um, you can uh, see, well, if we now had to do retention time scheduling, what would be the windows? Um, you know, I mean, you have measured all your heavy signals here. Um, you know, you can kind of click through those. If you now want to schedule, uh, what should be the, um, the scheduling thing? And uh, so what you can do is go to view, retention time, scheduling, and then, um, you know, one can just kind of choose what kind of windows one should uh, pick here in this particular case. And, you, you know, this is a trade-off that you have to see how fast your instrument is how, and you should aim for getting 8 to 10 points across the peak. And now um, you can really, you know, you can export your precursor list. Uh, you have um, for scheduling, for example, because you made a measurement initially where you didn't know where the retention times were, were, you made that list, and now that you have the retention time, you could actually schedule the runs here in this particular case. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So let me just, uh, yeah, let's just save this here as version 3 right now. In fact, um, if you wanted to schedule, um, to schedule just heavy, for example, you can also take the light uh, type out for now. So imagine uh, that now you have scheduled, uh, you have exported your scheduled list, uh, read it in into the instrument. And if now uh, you have run all the data, 
Um, now imagine um, we want to import all the data. Um, so that's actually quite similar like before. So let's just go to file import results. I mean, because once you now measure heavy and light, you have, you know, it's probably getting necessary to do some scheduling. Overall, um, we have here 106 precursor ions. Um, so let's go to import results, file import results, and then say OK. And then in webinar 17, PRM data and samples. So there's like a whole different set of samples here. So we can kind of highlight them all and uh, just open and import them all. So yeah, that, uh, you know, the PRM usually doesn't take too long. It's actually quite all right. So maybe while this is importing, we could, uh, so the retention time scheduling uh, block, let's just close that. Um, and let's close the other retention time replicate comparison also for now. Um, so let's set up our view for the peak areas a little bit. Uh, so let's go to view and then go to range graphs and let's say grouped. And um, so let's do three group panes. Um, and in fact, um, before we do that, um, you know, we may just uh, want to take the heavy run out here, um, see how that is maybe not so good here to have in. So let's just take that out. Um, so that's easy to do. You can go to edit, manage results, and maybe just take the heavy PRM run out here and remove that and say OK. And uh, maybe click on the second peptide here. Yep. And uh, so now let's tile the files. I think this is almost done uh, with the importing. And in fact, mine is, so I can close this. So go to view, arrange graphs, grouped. And then let's group three. So it seems like we have three groups, uh, G1, G2M, and then uh, something called S here. Let's say. Um, distribute graphs among groups, and then um, also document should be marked. So if you say OK here, and then you can see them quite nicely. Did that all uh, come out for you all in one row, like I have it? If it ever distributes it over two rows, you just make a little more space, uh, you know, so that it can actually fit them all in here. Um, so yeah, so this is basically your signal. Sometimes you can see in my case here, the peak area replicate comparison, the legend is so big, uh, it's really hard to see. So maybe what you can do is kind of click in this field and then just right mouse click and uh, you, we could for now maybe take the legend off. Then you can see the peptides a little bit easier here. So one thing is because we have light and heavy signal in, so maybe if you go to the second peptide, so click on the light number 639 and then click on the heavy 644. So what do you notice uh, from signal strength if you look at the light and then at the heavy, which is stronger? Heavy. In fact, that often happens because the heavy you really spike in at a reasonable dose that you always know you will always be able to measure, right? The light signal could be quite low because it's endogenous. So the heavy, you want to make sure in your system that you find a spike in level that works well in your matrix because if you for some reason don't see the heavy, um, then it's not worth having. I mean, you want to spike it in so you can see it and get a really nice uh, signal. So um, one thing what I want to do is let's make sure we have settings, integrate all checked. I always have that on. That's always a good thing to have. But let's do one thing now when you click on um, the, you know, we're on the second peptide, click on the peptide sequence. And then, um, I don't know if you have it, but if you don't click on right mouse click and, um, 
you know, um, oops, actually right mouse click transitions and then activate split graph. And so what you want to have is uh, transitions, you want to have all and split graph. So edit view transitions all split graph and then you see this where the upper now that's um, the light, you know, the upper is the light, but when you're on the peptide, you can actually now see both, which is kind of nice, um, you know, and so there's different, um, in this case, this particular peptide had, um, you know, two charge states, I think, so that makes it a little complicated. Uh, so let's maybe go to an, a peptide here. Um, yeah, a lot of them have like two charge states. Um, but this one, for example, right, the, so I'm here on the IADF, um, you know, so if we, you know, that has like these two were acquired for MS, MS in the PRM mode, and then this charge state C, it doesn't have the green little balls, so that those were not acquired. So we could actually kind of just delete those out, those are not part of the assay. I mean, it is redundant, what you often would do, you pick the charge state that ionizes better. Right, so if you have two charge states, you might as well pick often the more abundant uh, charge state, and then um, you know you don't have to measure the other one uh, because it's uh, it would give you a redundant result. Okay, but if you now uh, go, so if you go to this peptide IADF uh, GV or something, click on the peptide, and you can see the split graph here, which is also kind of nice. Um, but if we take the split graph off right mouse click and uh, transitions and then split graph off. Then you can actually see the pairs, right? So then if we, um, you know, if I were to put the legend back on, so let's maybe do that. Uh, I'll make a little space here with the library. Let's put the legend back on. See how now one, one is the light, one is the heavy. Which one is the light and which one is the heavy? So the green one is the heavy, right? Um, so this is actually this one, and you can see that the heavy um, supposedly is spiked in at all the same level. Um, so if you, for example, go to this um, particular peptide here, it might be easier if we just go go um, edit, collapse all, and then go to pep um, peptides, edit, collapse all peptides. You can uh, see which peptide I'm on. Um, see, I'm on this here, M A M Q um, Q A V. You can see that the heavy is relatively constant, not perfect, but other peptides here are better uh, than others. So the heavy is constant, that's what you want, right? And then the light, well, that's what the biology uh, is giving you, right? So you can, so in fact, do you see a difference between some of the different conditions here? Yes. Yeah. So this this group here, right? This G two. See, there the the light is always much higher than the other two conditions. But even here, this condition in the light should be higher than this here. So um, so that's the biology that is apparently for this particular peptide uh, significantly changing. We can already kind of tell just from this peak area view, right? And you can also see. So can you? So here, right, if you compare this to this, so this um, heavy is a little higher than that. How about the light for that same pair? So it's the same trend, right? The light is also a little bit higher in this replicate. So now, what can we do having the heavy standard? That, that normalizes that effect, right? So maybe here, the injection and was went just a little better or something, uh, right? Or for some reason, there was a little variability in the technical mass spectrometry acquisition. The heavy allows you to form the ratio, and then see that will adjust, uh, you know, things and, and provide you this. That's why it's so valuable having heavy standards, because it will provide you a mean of, of overcoming any kind of technical variability that the instrument may have. Or if there's a decrease of sensitivity, the heavy, as long as you have heavy spikes in, that can account for uh, a lot uh, of variability. So if you have heavy labels spiked in, 
that's much easier uh, in some sense versus doing label free because label free you have to make sure everything is always the same. Let's go to the peptide below here, this SPAG. And yeah, that looks pretty similar and that's also good because um, you know what that's also you have two peptides for the same protein. Um, you know, so it's kind of in interesting that they both behave in a similar direction. Let's go to the peptide below there. And yeah, so there's maybe a theme that a lot of um, the peptides are higher in the G2 condition here. And uh, yeah, so now it really uh, becomes, this is the data set that was acquired. Um, the normalization to the heavy will greatly help uh, normalizing this data set, even, um, you know, so that's quite valuable. I think, um, you know, let's go to the next peptide here. So, so in this case, right, so what, uh, what do you see here? What's your interpretation here? So that's a really high full change, right, to your uh, initial condition. So this data that seems to be relatively interesting, the biological replicates seem to behave very consistent, which that's always a good thing. So I uh, would highly predict if we went to, through um, you know, making statistical reports, now one could do a group comparison like we have done a couple of other days. Uh, one would define the different groups, right? So G2 to G1, and then uh, making those group comparison reports. Um, so this would probably give quite good statistics uh, to be stronger than that. But it's also interesting to think people when they did this uh, experiment, they most likely had a hypothesis, right? So they were at the point where they had bought heavy peptides. Maybe they had some initial evidence that this is something that may happen and may change. Um, so, and maybe, uh, you know, with this data set, they could kind of confirm a hypothesis that they had. So, you know, in this targeted analysis, often people go in with some kind of hypothesis. So um, I think that's actually quite uh, nice here in this case. So I think, you know, when you are going back, um, you know, feel free to look a little bit more through these data sets. All the same rules apply, like what you've learned all the days, you know, what are, are there any interferences? And the PRM certainly gives you opportunities where one can easily take out interferences if they were. But actually now, see, I, I, I am on the same peptide here, QLL, or QLEEE, -E -E, and um, see how this pair wasn't uh, monitored. Instead, the 3 plus was monitored here. Maybe it gave a better signal. And you can see how clean, um, you know, the signal was in this case, right? So if we actually, um, this and the replicates are good and very consistent and uh, they seem much higher in this condition versus here and still quite a bit higher from here to here. If we do the synchronized zooming, Sorry, let's click in this uh, very right field here. You usually want to click in the highest condition. Left mouse click and then right mouse click. Synchronized zooming is checked. So I can click in the thing here and then go with your wheel a little. See how um, this does show you some kind of, it, it matches it, um, you know, to, um, you know, the same scale. Um, I may not have uh, one from each group here in my grouping. Maybe I, I did the grouping uh, before I took that first, uh, you know, heavy standard out, but it doesn't matter. But I think it gives you an opportunity to look a little bit through some of the data and you have that um, the tutorial is in the same folder. So you can go back and look a little bit at it. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much how um, PRM data looks like. Um, it looks just like SRM data, but it's high resolution. You can see the mass accuracy there. It's like 1.9 ppm, so very good uh, mass accuracy. And um, yeah, so any questions about the PRM? Yes. So uh, this is the preliminary setup of developing a PRM method, right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, we want to monitor only those peptides. So in that case, would you recommend uh, monitoring every one of the transition, every one of the peptides? Uh, from that point, how will you move? Forward? Okay. 
So because it is PRM, it will always monitor all fragment ions. So that's a that's an advantage, right? Um, so it will always have that. It's usually good to have um, two or three, or I mean, three peptides per protein, maybe. Um, but you know, there's a lot of uh, opinions out there what people do, and I think it also depends on what what your project is and you know, m how many things you want to monitor at the same time. I mean, the multiplexing capabilities of PRM are quite good. I don't think it's necessary to restrict oneself to a very small set, particularly if one has bought heavy peptides, one might as well, um, sure, if one has a heavy peptide where the light now is always super interfered or never shows up, sure, we would uh, dismiss that. But um, yeah, one could continue to refine this assay a little bit more and then maybe they have like a large cohort that they now can run. But yes, one could really now having a small set like this go through and maybe eliminate interfering fragment ions already. Um, you know, they eliminated redundant charge states already. Um, you know, and peptides that maybe don't ionize after all, one could get rid of, but yeah. Mm -hmm. 